for now. Okay. So can we do the intro now? Yes, let's do the intro. Come on. Well, let's start it. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Zolo and KT show. I'll get you to come in a bit. Sorry to interrupt you. We'll just restart it. We won't restart the live. We'll just restart it. We love, People love to... Yeah, be careful. I'm telling you right now, it's temperamental, those microphones. <laughs> must be male. Must be male. <laughs> Don't even start. <laughs> Don't I'm a loser start. right now with two of you. Dude, you come over here, mate. We'll start giving her a roasting. I should have. Um, anyway, the entr- entrance. Go, oh, come on, Katie. You're the you're the queen me. entrance. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Zolo and KT show. Um, third guest. What a lineup we've had this evening. Um, is that right? But I'm going to introduce Kurt Thompson, who is founder of Motions in Mo- Motions of Movement and um, a mental health program called Project U. Um, which we'll go into a little bit more. I first met Kurt because when I moved to where I live, I joined my local gym and he was the personal training manager, which I didn't know of, but one of the first and only PTs who even approached me and asked me, how's my training going? Is there anything that I can help you with? Um, and then we just got chatting and, and then before we knew it, we connected because I, I was a PT and, um, and, and exercising and then, yeah, it just kind of evolved from there. He's in, now he's um, up at... Erina. So that's enough of my intro. I'm going to let you introduce yourself because I'm sure you're going to do a much better job than me. And I'm having technical failures in the background oh, no. here, but so you go, you go. You... So welcome, Kirk. Tell us, tell us in your words <laughs> what Thank I just you. tried to wrap up. Um, yeah, so basically been in the industry for about 12 years now. Um, just coming out of school, not knowing sort of where to go. Always played football, rugby league. Um, was getting paid at the time to play rugby league, so sort of just followed in the footpath of fitness. Who, who did you play for? I uh, played up on the coast, played at the entrance of Wild. Oh, nice. Um, Wild Wolves. Played Wild Wolves? Rouge. 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 Rouge, yeah, That's it. the entrance Tigers. Okay. Then I went off and played um, played in Sydney for a little bit at Belmain and then played at a um, bit of New South Wales Cup for the Storm. So, yeah. Um, was that the Cronulla and Storm team? No, it was just before that. So okay. It was, yeah, it was based on the coast. with Central Coast Storm. Okay. But we had all the, the players from Melbourne fly up every weekend and, yeah, playing and Back off the training. Front rower? <laughs> no, definitely not. No? I played in the halves. Did you play in the yeah, halves? about 25 kilos ago. No way. <laughs> yeah, so halves. I'm not yeah. bad. And see, Katie said you're looking big, and I'm saying the same. You're looking solid more than yeah. anything. It's, yeah. Is it more of like your, your program that you're doing now? No, so I'm not too sure what it is. I think I just hold... Hold fluid would be better than most people. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I wish I could. My, yeah, my. I literally haven't hit a weights program in probably about two and a half years. Oh, it's really? Pretty weird, yeah. I do the odd occasional session and stuff like that, but teach a lot of spin classes and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think that sort of keeps me in touch a little bit. Mm. But, yeah, nothing, nothing program orientated for a little while. Yeah, okay. That must feel good, though, to have a little bit more flexibility around your own training program. Like, for for other people that to have their rigid training program set day by day by day it could yeah. kind of get tedious and a bit boring. Yeah. So you're doing mixed up mixed up spin classes. What else are you doing? Yeah. So basically, mostly my spin class at the moment. Then I just go in and just hit forty minutes on the, in the gym floor. I'll just run between machines. I've never been one to sit there and and do a structured program. I always walked in at footy training and the, the strength and conditioning coaches had something up on the whiteboard to do. Um, or I've just gone into the gym and just, just ran around sort of like a maniac for 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just bounce between machines and that's pretty much it, yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. after the, the rugby, the storm, what happened then? Yeah, so I um I done my back in actually. I went to training one night and I was transitioned through and went back to the entrance to play. Uh, played a couple of years there after the storm. And then just basically lost the passion a little bit, just lost it and you get... Like just getting belted at training all the time, and you just <laughs> wrestling and, and shit, and, yeah, oh, stuff wrestling like that. and that. So then I went back to I still wanted to be affiliated because I like being around boys and all that sort of stuff, but just didn't want to be tied up to going every Sunday and training four nights a week and stuff like that. So I um, transitioned into being their strength and conditioning coach. So I had about 180 players under me, um, all the different grades and stuff like that. Then um, just went into some drill, and I was thinking about playing again. Went into a tackling drill and it was a three on three on two, and one of their front rowers just ran at me and we sort of collided and wrestled him to the ground and went home and laid down and didn't get up for three days. Wow! So I done my lower back in and sort of that was the point where I had to choose either go down the work path or go down the 
get me back better and go down the fitness and footy path. So I chose work, yeah. Mate, I had weird. I had a similar sort of story. My mates kept telling me to come back and play rugby league with them for mascot jets. Yeah. I was only A grade and had like two years out of playing footy. I stopped playing footy when I was like 25, 26. And we were doing the same, like a drill as well, like a tackling yeah. gauntlet drill or something, just little fun and games. And I had this big, like, Tongan, <laughs> and he was only 15 years old, like legitimately only 15. Yeah. I'm like, I've, I don't care how big this guy is. I'm going to run straight at him. Ran into him head first, and he almost <laughs> knocked me out, and my neck was stiff the next four days, and I came off second best. So when you come off second best to a 15-year-old, you know that's it. That's probably time when <laughs> I hang up the boots there. So yeah, that was my last training session as well, mate. So yeah. injuries. It's horrible. <laughs> Age and injuries, I think. How about that? Age and injuries. Age and injuries. But, <laughs> but it's hard though. Like I don't think people understand the rugby league background and this is what I always back rugby league. I don't know if I'm just biased, but the pre-seasons that you go through are just absolutely ridiculous to the point where I feel as though that is one of the things where it has um, that you can translate into different sports. And the reason why I think I can prove that in the way that how many NRL players go off and play other sports and do and go to the highest level? Yeah. Where how many other sports come to rugby league? You know, does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. And like, I think that was sort of isolated too when back in about five years ago, I think they used to have the fittest athlete or something. Australia's on the gay athlete, Billy, yeah, Billy Slater. Billy Slater used to win it every yeah, year. Every like, year. And it's not saying that they're any better than anyone else. I just think they they correlate a bit better with. Everything that goes on in life. Conditioning, yeah. mind conditioning as well. Well, it, that's what I mean. That's what I was going to ask you next, like strength and conditioning. I mean, yeah. do you do you find that the case? Or am I being biased to rugby league? Like we can translate uh, our strength because we're doing wrestling. So that that brings over to like a martial arts aspect of things. Yeah. You're having the big tough guys. You're doing the – obviously the, the, the powerlifting stuff as well. Then you're doing the these – we used to have four and fives. You had to do four laps in five minutes. Five minutes yeah. Four and fives. That were that were just ho- like so ridiculous. Lap day, threshold to training. Yeah, so you're doing five minutes. Then you're doing pond runs in Centennial Park for like k's, and then you're doing hundred meter sprints. They used yeah. to make us do like sixty one hundreds or like yeah. ten ten forties. Like all that is all different. Do you find that I'm am I being biased to rugby league, or do you think there is a diverse? Oh, I think strength and conditioning. I think you preach into the choir. Yeah, I'm yeah, probably yeah. biased as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's yeah. I think it's just everything to do with it. I, I, if you run a marathon runner against a swimmer, the marathon runner is going to win. Mm. If you swim, if you swim a swimmer against a runner, the swimmer is going to win. Mm. I think it, yeah. I think with rugby league, there is so many different components to it. Um, but yeah, I think we might be being a bit biased. But well, I don't know awesome. because like, like honestly, I've um. The sports that I've gone to, and it's not from an ego standpoint. I'm pleased. That I hope I'm not coming across egotistical. No. But I did run a marathon. In I've done two half marathons, two city of surfs, yeah. and a full marathon. The marathon I ran in 28 days of preparation. Yeah. Like that's just I don't know. Ran stairs. I ran stairs to prepare for it, <laughs> but. But there's got to be that sort of energy system training that you've done in the past. In the past. That correlates over to... That's what, that's what I mean. Like, And I've done a boxing fight. Like, that's a six-minute explosive, three-round, getting your head punched in yeah. competition with six-week preparation, four weeks in marathon, and then done halves, and then obviously going into Oztag and playing these others. That's yeah. pretty similar. But the thing is, I have the confidence in the strength and conditioning component always. Yeah. And if you were to throw a boxer... In a rugby league match, that stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah. If you were to put a marathon runner in a rugby league match, you would tell that they were a marathon runner. Mm. Like, so I I definitely see what you're, you're pointing out there. But what yeah. what is it? What what do you think it is? Like being a strength and conditioning coach, what 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 are you what are you doing that's that's a translatable? I'm always searching for that. Probably Maybe. what you're not doing, like rugby league, you sort of do everything. Like you mentioned, you've got the the BJJ wrestling coach there. You've got people in just different categories, you train, you're train. training different energy systems, so you might go on a 3K run, like you might go on and do your 40 minute sprints. It's completely transparent to what position you play, I think, too. Mm. Um, I remember walking into training at Belmain and we had three different programs for three different type body types and then we'd go out and we'd have our fat boys club would hang around behind and do an extra half an hour of, of training. And it's, yeah, you just touch base on so many different aspects of fitness mm. um it's similar to crossfit like they train everything you throw a crossfitter in certain sports 
they would yeah. excel. But, but yeah. also with rugby, you're conditioning from when you're eight years old, right? So you're conditioning that way. Yeah. With CrossFit, you might pick it up when you're 25. Yeah. Whereas if you're conditioning the way you are for rugby league from eight years old, I mean, that's got to transfer into any sport yeah. when you age as well. Yeah. So I can't I can't have this conversation with a rugby union. Oh. Uh, but I'm, <laughs> I'm living with... Uh, my partner and her brother plays for the USA in rugby union. I still hats off to rugby union players. Yeah. Like they're still, it's different. It's more niched for different positions yeah. where it's a little bit different in terms of the fitness component. But you could throw a rugby league player in any sport, um, not any sport, but a lot more sports. But then if you throw one front rower from rugby union in another sport, they would, they wouldn't know how to play. Yeah, it. we see that with like Matt Rogers and Ryan Cross and mm. Bobby Dakiri and. Wendell Saylor, yeah. um, Israel Folau. You guys should just yeah. do a podcast post Monday, uh, post Tuesday rugby league in season. In season, that's <laughs> it. One of my best mates growing up, his brother played professional rugby union, played for Australia and stuff like that, and the, the pickles we used to get. No, always. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always. And I think because they are pretty similar, like you never get into an argument with an AFL player. No, like it's it's because they're similar. Like it's a tackle thing. It's a. But this has been bred from from the early when it, whenever I don't even know the year that rugby league and rugby union was made. Rugby league was created, stemmed off rugby union. Yeah. But then it was stemmed, and this is the thing about rugby unions don't get. They always see themselves as like a little bit more snobby. Yeah. Um, yeah, because like they're said, private schoolers. Yeah, exactly. But they weren't aware that rugby league players were actually the first paid athletes. Because they're always the poor ones, so you would go to ticket to grand final or ticket to um, the the weekly games of rugby league, and those people didn't have any money, so they were paid athletes yeah. back in the early nineteen twentieth century. So rugby league were the first pros, mate. <laughs> but then you've got soccer also, yeah. Which I've got most of my mates do play soccer actually, and I've had some pickles with them. And rugby league actually stemmed off soccer because they. I think it was William Webb or something, pick up a soccer ball and run with it and his mates tackled him or something. Oh, is that how it worked? I think okay. that's how it sort of generated, yeah. Interesting. So, um, yeah, there's so many things. But yeah, I definitely understand where rugby league, mm. they transfer between so many different sports. We always have this, you know, we've had these couple of questions before with... Um, After coffee? After coffee, yeah. <laughs> so you shouldn't have given me that sure coffee. See how it's quiet in the other two podcasts? Get one coffee and it'd be boom, uh, straight. It might be the, the, the content that he's so passionate content, about as passionate. well. Passionate. No, but I'm just, I always like to see sports that can translate into other things, mm. you know, and, and make you better across the board. Because if you want to become an athlete, that's the best way to become an athlete is to have a program or, in your case, non-program, but you're still fit running around but you can translate that into other areas of your life. Yeah. I find that that's yeah, probably definitely. the most important thing to me anyway. Yeah, and I think also like when you're playing rugby league at, at a level and from so young, you get that drive and that competitiveness. Mm. So even if I went into, like I know I'm not anywhere near where I was my fittest, but if I stood next to someone at a 100 meter sprint, I'd probably back myself still mm. just because I've got that grit yeah. to just keep moving and drive mm. through. Um, and that's purely from built from rugby league when you just you're in the trenches and you in the grind of five six days a week training yeah you run on 400s after 400s you just you just can't physically do it so you just got to find that spot yeah a personality thing as well because i'm like that on a treadmill <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's maybe it's a, maybe it is a personality thing maybe it attracts those top the type of people in in that sport you know that competitive I think it's a bit of an ego thing too. Yeah. yeah so. A bit. Massive. <laughs> well, you're looking at the person running next to you on the tree, you're yeah. like, you're up and you're sleeping. Well, that's pretty common too. Yeah, like, don't push them. Oh, yeah. Don't push them over, Kate. You're not allowed to push. You know? It's, it's a... water in their face. <laughs> <laughs> Squirt over there. Yeah. <laughs> Pull the plug out. Yeah. <laughs> on the tree. Yeah. I don't think we had a welcome in. I think we just sort of had a welcome in and then we just started spieling about rugby league anyway. Oh, yeah. We? So you're coming off the rugby lead after the storm and your accident and you went down the work path yeah where what did that lead you um i sort of just digged into work i've got a pretty addictive personality so i just hooked into work and i was freshly from cert four um 2007 i think it was um so yeah i just i just got the work bug and i just got delved into it and i was training started off pretty slow and i sort of done what every cert four trainer does and just tell up all your clients. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was just sort of underdeveloped and uneducated. I, and then coming from the football background where I would just get towed up. So it was 
flog my clients and I went on that sort of path for about two years um, and then sort of started to mature a little bit and I had some good trainers in the staff room. I think that's pretty important. Yeah. Um, some people doing degrees in exercise, sports science and physiology and stuff like that that didn't necessarily pull, say anything to you but you pick up conversations as you're sitting there having lunch and so I just went down that path and then sort of started to work with my business at Genesis Fitness. So I was there for about eight years. Um, then it got to, I was doing anywhere between sort of 80 and 100 sessions a week. 80 to effects. 100 sessions? Yeah, I was working I was working ridiculous hours and I was burning the candle and I felt it. Mm. So I just hit a brick wall one day and I just, I just went, that's enough. Yeah. So I was doing that for oh, probably about, I'd say, two to three years. Um, yeah, and that was including my Group X and I was teaching Group X because I didn't have a chance to exercise. So I was doing three or four cycle classes a week and sort of getting into the classes. So that was sort of about four or five hours of training I was doing a week, which kept me on my toes a bit. Um, yeah, then went over to Europe and come home from Europe. A bit of weight and as you do. Went over <laughs> Big hangover. Home. Yeah, went over there for four months with, um, with, with two mates, two good mates. So I'd done that and then come back and transitioned back into the work life sort of thing. Um, and then my actual gym that I was at, Genesis Fitness Club in Gosford, transitioned through a transitional phase where they moved from a, a gym to an activity sort of centre. They'd bring in cliff and climb walls and they'd bring right. in an altitude room and hot awesome. yoga and stuff like that. So I think that was my cue when I was, it was time to get out. So the opportunity right. at Fitness First come up. And I took that chance with um, when I was at the Tugger Club. And at, during that time, I started up working with different programs and stuff like that. And sort of my time became a little bit more restricted when Tugra closed down. Um, and I had to move to Sydney to work with Fitness First. So I developed, all my clients were asking me at that time, can you do more sessions? I want a couple more sessions. And my time was limited. I was getting up at 4.30 in the morning. I was getting home at 9.30 at night. So um, I started to develop little groups off that. So they could get their extra session in, but... I didn't have to spend more time really with a lot of more sessions. So that's where the sort of the project started that I was doing, I'm still doing at the moment. It started as a, it was called a move project. And it was just all my clients just basically getting together and it was designed around just moving and it was three sessions a week. And then um, it's sort of over the last two years, it's just evolved. I'm being pretty lucky to have a lot of clients that have hung around for about eight years with me. So um, Big retention. Yeah, so it's, and the retention through the project is really good. So it's just it's just been something that I've just slowly moulded and what I've got today, yeah. So it's pretty much the progression of me so far. What do you think the key thing is for retention of clients? I think that was one of the things that I felt that I did well, one of the few things that I probably did well in business <laughs> yep. is to be, have the ability to retain clients. Yeah. But I could never put my finger on why. Why do you think that people do? Is there an active thing that you think you do? I think it's just generally caring for someone. Like, yeah, most of my clients at the moment that have stayed with me for so long, you just generally care for them. And you see a lot of trainers out there that they're in it for the money, they're in it for a quick quick hit, they're working 60 sessions a week, 80 sessions a week. That, But the first, the session you see at 6 a.m. in the morning is the same session you see the client at 8 mm. o'clock at night. Yeah. They're on the roller there. It's the same thing. It's not individualised to a point. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think the... The connection you have with them, um, the community you can sort of, you can surround them with, like other clients and small group stuff and that. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I found basically works a bit with me. Yeah. And I niched off a little bit about four years ago. I started working with special needs people and disabled people. So I worked heavily a bit with people with like spina bifida and quadriplegics and paraplegics and stuff like that. So, so what are we are we are we allowed to do that as PTs or is there a, uh, another course? I thought we was weren't allowed to do that. No, you can. You can't do yeah, it, can't yeah. you? As like, long as you properly screen if there's any yeah. referrals that you need to make, if there's any allied, allied health professionals. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think the biggest risk comes if they've just had the accident. Or you can make potential to make things worse. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've yeah. never trained before and they've become a you know paraplegic and they come to, to you and say, hey, can you train me? Like, what have you been doing? Yeah. You know, nothing. Um, I, you know, I've had an accident when I was seven, my spinal cord or whatever it might be. Um, can you train me? Then I would probably say, can you work with an allied health professional first mm. or can I work alongside one? I think yeah, that's, that's, I think yeah. that's important. You've sort of got to drop the ego a little bit too and know when to refer on. Yeah. Um, I would not really take any of them on without 
a physio written like certificate or a doc probably not so much a doctor certificate because I don't really they're not going to know too much about the exercise side of things. Um, but I'll I'll deal with like an exercise physiologist or a physio, and even if they haven't seen one before, I'll I'll make sure I send them to one, and I'll I'll get them in the right channels and, and yeah. refer to one of the physios that I refer to, or mm. yeah, I'll get them to do. I actually just dealt with that yesterday. I had a guy come in that's just had back surgery, L four L three L four shaved down, can struggle to walk a little bit, and I've just referred him to an EP to go get a screening test done and some clearances, and then. They'll come back. Mm. I think that's where you got to be pretty, pretty good with it. You got to, you got to do the best by the person. Mm. If, if they never come back to me and they they're happy with the EP, yeah. perfectly fine. I've done my job. Uh, and are you are you training in in a gym? Did you say, or are you training in a outdoors or your own gym? How does it work? Yeah, so I do I do both sort of things. So, so I'm a fitness manager at the moment at Central Trevor Leagues Fitness, a gym on the coast. Um, so that was actually the gym. That took over Genesis Fitness Club, and then when I veered to the fitness first, about eighteen months now they called me to come back. So I come back about eighteen months ago. So I do majority of my stuff in the gym, and then I do my project outside of the gym. Okay. So yeah, the project you go run is outside of the gym. Yeah. Unless unless weather conditions controls us to come into the gym, but it's awesome to have that sort of flexibility. If it is raining outside, mm -hmm. you don't need to find that only yeah. space. It's Five meters by five meters, and you've got twenty people in front of you. Yeah, you can bring them into the gym, and if it's perfectly fine outside, we can run around outside. Yeah, yeah. that's a good mix. Because I found that hard when I was I was doing boot camps five days a week, and then you know if it's pissing down and rain in the middle of winter, what do you do with these yeah. guys? Yeah, try your attention in winter. Yeah, <laughs> difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another yeah. thing that I found when I was at fitness first. I was still traveling to Gosford most mornings through winter and train my clients. Mm. And I look back at it now like. I was training some of them in the rain at two degrees at five a.m. in the morning, yeah. and I look at them now and I think, "You're a superhero to me." Like, yeah, there's no way I'd be getting out of bed at five in the morning. Hundred percent. Yeah, mate. I had a four thirty in the morning session once, and it stemmed from a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, was uh, a little bit overweight. Yeah. He come to me and we more pissed, drunk as you do, and it was like three days before Christmas, and he goes. Mate, I want to lose weight. And I go, all right, buddy. Let's book in a session then. And I was pissed as well. I'm like, put you in my diary, you know. Like, and then I forgot about it. <laughs> Two weeks later, he rings me up. goes, we're on tomorrow at 4.30. I go, what, p.m.? He goes, a.m. I go, who the fuck decided that one? He goes, you did. Because I go, I, I couldn't fit him in anywhere else. So I decided to train him at 4.30 in the morning. I thought there would be like two sessions in him. Yeah. Another mate came down next week. From school, there was two of them, and then another mate, and ended up being like five or six of these boys. I was trying to get rid of them. Four thirty in the morning, <laughs> then they started doing two and three a week. I was doing oh, two or three four thirty a.m. sessions. So you got to get a new phone number. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> I deleted my Facebook. I, I moved to Yamba. Really that's what I did. Roundabout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's a really important part, and what makes it PT successful as well is that you know that it's not going to be nine to five. And if you're that passionate about it, you will. Like when I had my personal training studio for six years, same thing. You know, you're doing split shifts. You're doing 60 hours a week. You're, I was washing towels, cleaning floors, washing mirrors. And it, it was a 5 a.m. get up or 4.30 depending on what time your first client was. And it was not getting home until 9 o'clock. Mm. And I think people who enter the industry do forget that it is those sort of hours. And, it, and it, you might have a break during the day or you might be, you know, on every night. And I think it's really good training like 12 years later. I'm still up at 4.30 in the morning regardless yeah. of what day it is. <laughs> but I think that's grit. And I yeah. think that, you know, people forget that when, they, when they're dealing with personal trades or want to become personal mm. It's tough, yeah. And you've got to treat that client at 8 p.m. exactly like you do at 6 a.m. They're paying the same quality, they're paying the same service, and you've got to deliver on that. Mm. When it's tough sometimes, yeah. And you're natural. I'm a naturally a morning person anyway. So that on morning sessions, I'm on game, like coffee there, 5 o'clock, but the nighttime sessions were yeah. off me. Like, I'm like, <laughs> it takes a lot more to get it out there at seven o'clock at night than it does at five o'clock in the morning. I think I was like more like a European, like an Sleep. Italian, just slept through the day. <laughs> you have to keep it up. You've got to have them siestas. Yeah, like yeah. midday to three midday to 3 p.m. Leave me alone. Don't answer any phone calls. <laughs> and if forget about doing a midday session. Yeah. That's my nap time, yeah. baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty lucky now because the gym I'm at, we're heavily corporate. Yeah. So from midday, from probably eleven thirty to one pm, one thirty pm, 
It's the busiest time in the gym. Mm. Um, so yeah, and like I'm lucky enough to have the fitness manager role. So I, I work through the day, and I pretty much don't. I work one night a week. Yeah, so Wednesday good. night I'm there from five thirty in the morning till about eight o'clock at night. But look, Monday, Tuesday I'm gone by two. I'm still I'm confused. So you at the the leagues club now, or you at back at Hornby Fitness first? No, so I left Hornby Fitness first about eighteen months ago. Yeah, okay. And I went back to Central Coast Leagues Fitness, which is in Boston. Awesome. So I've been there for about the last eighteen months. Mm. As a fitness manager and PT. Yeah, PT, fitness manager, group fitness manager, Project U person. Like, so Project U, yeah. tell us about that. Yeah, so Project U sort of stemmed from me just having not enough time and clients wanting extra sessions. Mm. So it started as the Move Project, me and my partner developed that. Um, and it was just about getting people together just to move. It was no fitness goals, it was it was just come down and just move, like just we'll just be together for an hour, three times a week, and we'll just we'll just move. It's just nothing was nothing was ever put in place. Um, so we ran that and the first one I think went for ten weeks. And it was at a pretty tough time because the week that it started was my first week at Macquarie Fitness First. So I was, I was on the train and I was getting back by 6 p.m. I'd have to leave Fitness First at Macquarie at 4, 4.30 p.m. So I was there early and I was doing PTs at 5 in the morning and jumping on the 8.30 train and getting there and then coming back. And the days were just so long. So that sort of come in. And just over the last two years, it's been running now. It's just evolved and adapted. And my clients have been really good with that. Like... I've run a 10-week program, then I, I thought an eight-week program would work better, so I've done an eight-week one, and then I found over eight weeks, people were dropping off around week four and losing a bit of motivation, so then I'd come back at week seven, so I moved to a four-week program, and then I just found that wasn't the best thing for it, so now at the moment, it's an eight-week program, where we catch up three times a week, and it's Monday morning at 5.45, Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m., and then Saturday morning at 7 a.m. So Out of where? Where are you running that from? So I run most of it. Monday morning is an outdoor thing, so I run that in Gosford. Um, every second week we do boxing. Every other week we do strength in the gym. Then on Wednesday night we do an outdoor sort of circuit style thing. And then on and then the last 15 minutes of that we all just chill and um, we do some meditation to finish off. And then on a Saturday we go down. It's an excursion. We go down to the beaches. So we're at Terrigal Beach, we're at Longwood Beach, and we just get out on the sand. And then after that, we, we go and have a coffee and just get together and just chat about That's it. what I miss about the PT life. Just <laughs> like the, having the having, having the coffee with your clients coffee. after after training and that. So it's really big on community, it sounds like. Yeah, that's business. pretty much what it is, yeah. Mm. And that's how I treat all my clients. And um, they, they when they take on the service and stuff like that, they... They sort of buy into not just the sessions, they get involved with everything, which is mm. pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's basically ran on community. And yeah. I don't like it's it's quite cheap. I don't I don't do it for the money and I don't do any one on ones for the money either. Mm. It's um purely just for the passion of it. And it's pretty good to still have it after the twelve years. Yeah. yeah. Twelve years later, that's a big that's a long time in the industry. Yeah. Should get you three year, three month long service leave, mate. <laughs> Do you reckon they pay nice. you for that? Yeah. Clients pay you for three months. Three and months. You don't work. Months. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure, I'm not I'm not you know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always trial out and talk about trialing out. Tell us about the mental health program that you're putting together at the moment. Well. Yeah, so that's adapted with the Project U. So we've just added things in like the meditation and the coffee after the Saturday morning things. I just find that my goal as the PT and as the, the Project U sort of creator. It's to always make the client walk out better than they walked in. Like feeling better it doesn't necessarily need to be that they're stronger or they're faster or anything like that. It's just my goal every session is to make them walk out feeling better than they walked in. So, um, yeah, I try and stick to that as close as I can. Um, and my why of why I do everything, PT-wise and everything, it's just to eliminate the stress in everyday life. So that's pretty much where I'm going with the project. Um, it's just trying to make people feel better and everyone knows or most people know that the best program not done is still a horrible program. The worst program done is still an okay program. So yeah. it's, um, yeah, I started to look into the last couple of months, like the effects of like dopamine, serotonin, um, endorphins and all that sort of stuff. So I started to play around a little bit with that and they're like my little guinea pigs at the moment. I, I just trial things on them and take and them I'm or try happy. them. <laughs> hey? Take them or can you, can you take that um, orally? Or <laughs> oh, you know, dopamine you're very and serotonin? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I find that interesting what you brought up though, like the dopamine serotonin levels because I've been doing a, I've done a lot of CrossFit for, I don't know, six months. Like I just wanted to 
give it a good yeah, crack, the CrossFit, it, yeah. yeah, give it a good crack, the CrossFit world. I was doing four or five mornings a week. I'm pretty similar to yourself. I see a lot of um, qualities that I have in yourself, like the addictive personality type yeah. of thing. I'm probably just a larrikin <laughs> <laughs> and good with a beer. Maybe I'm, I'm shit with a beer. You're probably good with a beer. Ah. Probably we differ. <laughs> um, so I find it interesting that after that five months of CrossFit, I went and played this Oztag uh, World Cup thing a couple of weeks ago and I tore my hammy and adductor, like okay. grade two tear. So I stopped CrossFit and I've been into doing swimming the last few weeks. I find myself, it's a bit cheesy to say, but I find myself a lot more at peace, a little bit more relaxed, um, and I'm doing things in a non-competitive way where I'm usually a competitive person. The CrossFit's like slam, tension, let's go, yeah, rip got, in. You've got seven minutes to do this. Seven minutes yeah. to do this, go. Like It's like that sort of, even though the CrossFit gym that I had was still a good gym that worked on a lot of mobility and, and those sorts of things. But going to a swimming pool for an hour straight and going back to that longevity of type of training, I find myself now like calm, relaxed. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if it's a sense of meditation within that long form of swimming or it is replenishing the serotonin and dopamine and all these other things that I probably lost doing this high-intensity exercise all the time i don't know i'm sort of in the same position as yourself yeah um, playing around with it and i find that it's just i'm getting a lot more benefit mindset wise and and i'm feeling a lot leaner because yeah. of it as well well it's trial and error with everything isn't it mm. like people react different to that's where the individuality comes into it people react different to different things mm. but swimming would be quite like therapeutic like how many thoughts would you have looking at that black line for <laughs> my <laughs> hour Get me off of this yeah. blank line would be my thought the whole time. No, see, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. Like, all these thoughts come up and it's like meditation yeah. to me. It's like if you do sit there and do 20 minutes of meditation, I was doing it pretty frequently. I stopped. I should keep getting back into the swing of things again because you get a lot of benefit from it. But I found the first 10 minutes of meditation, all these thoughts are coming up. This is stupid. I'm... I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm too good for meditation. <laughs> this is for the yogis. Leave it to the fucking yogis. Yeah. Get up, Liam. Stand up. Like all these thoughts come through your head, yeah. and the same thoughts come up when I'm swimming. You're choking. You're terrible. <laughs> you. You know. You. You're in your swimmers. You don't look good in swimmers. Like what? You got a pasty white body. But whatever comes up. But after that ten minutes, the thoughts seem yeah. to just yeah. drift away. Because yeah. it just, just seems to just pass through all these stupid thoughts, and then you can just get in this sort of feeling calm and relaxed yeah. sort of vibe so it's just interesting to see i think it's got a lot to do with cortisol and I, I know what you mean when you're stressed and when i've had clients who are stressed and they you know finding it hard to lose weight and then a trainer comes in there and just does massive hit sessions six times a week right hit crossfit crossfit hit, 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 hit. this increases that cortisol in their body which inhibits fat loss anyway right yeah. that's why it's there and then not only are they now not losing weight they're more stressed than they were before and um, you get a bloated belly because you're too you know you've got cortisol you know adrenaline or adrenal that. fatigue or yeah, whatever and it is adrenal fatigue mm. is what Result. So I think that's an important part is to understand, you know, where's the client at? You know, do we give them a nice gentle session? Mm. Is it that that's what they need as opposed to, you know, high intensity flog the hell out of them? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think that's where you've got to really, that's where that what gives a good personal trainer, puts him on that pedestal, I guess. Yeah. They understand what their client needs. Um, I done a course at the start of the year actually through the PTA Academy. Um, oh, yeah. PTA Global. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was a mentorship and it was probably one of the best courses I've done and it was probably at a perfect time for me because I was starting to play around with all of the, the stress through exercise and the... Traditional, uh, progressive, hybrid. Yeah, exactly. I've talked yeah. about this on the oh, yeah. po podcast before. Yeah. They're, that's awesome. Yeah, so Don Remedios. Yeah. yeah. That's it, yeah. So Mel and Garth and the one that i done in at Terrigal and they had like a... It was system... It was a Dr. O, it's called. So it's the um, daily readiness observation. And it's just three questions that you ask your clients, and they, they stem off different things. It's physical, mental, and emotional, and they're questions similar to, you don't have to answer the questions like, you don't ask them like script form, but sort of the physical is like, how well are you feeling, like, are you physically ready to feel, or like train today? Are you injured or sore anywhere and stuff like that? And then you went to the mental with, how much stress have you been under? Are you sleeping okay? And all that sort of stuff. And then the emotional side of things. So you get a point system and it's one to nine. Um, so one to three, I think, was pretty much green light. You can do whatever you want with this client. They're ready to go. They're, everything's perfectly fine. They've drunk enough water. They've eaten in the last six hours. They're, they're pretty good. 
And then you've got four to six, I think, was like cautionary, sort of like traffic light system. Yeah. And then six plus was red, slow down. And that could vary, like someone could come in and you don't know what's happened when they're walking into the gym or their baby might have been choking in the morning, like that night before and yeah. their stress levels increased and they've been stuck in traffic so their, their stress levels are through the roof and you just ask them, like, how are you feeling? And that everyone sort of these days says, how are you feeling? And they were great, thanks. It's just... Just a oh, not bad. Math. Not bad. Yeah, not bad, yeah. Not bad. <laughs> They've just been stuck in... Well, are you not good then? Are you not yeah. bad? What are you? Yeah. Tell me, mate. <laughs> it's no 50-50. <laughs> so it's not multiple choice, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, like I started to put my clients through that and that sort of gave me a better indication of how they were feeling, so what we could do. And the project, you sort of inherit that a little bit by, if you turn up, there might be some people that turn up that might be annoying and they're just... They've been stuck in traffic. They might be a nurse, for instance, and they've had a horrible person come in that's cardiac arrest or something like that, and there's some people there that are a three, and then you've got 20 people in you, and there's a three and a five and a seven and a nine. Yeah, how does that what work? do you do? So yeah. they, like, we, we do a lot of gamification at the start, so we do a lot of games, so to, to bring the stress levels back and bring everyone back together, and you sort of find, if you go up to a person and say, oh, how are you feeling, and they'll go, yeah, I'm sort of about a seven, like, I'm just stuck in traffic, and I was driving home from Sydney, and I had a, seen a car crash, and all this sort of stuff, so they're a seven. And then you start to play games for about three or four minutes. They start to laugh and they start to have a bit of fun. And then you'll go, oh, how are you now? And they'll be like, I'm four. Bang, you're ready to go, so you're off. Mm. Um, and I'll, I'll do that throughout the whole sessions. Like, it's not – through one of the transitions of the project, I had a fitness games day, um, and it was every Wednesday night we play games for an hour. Take a soccer ball down, ultimate frisbee, knee tap games, and just everything for an hour. And I found that didn't have the same response as if I just do it sporadically. Um, so we'll warm up with games and then we might do sort of like a five-minute hand wrap, seven-minute hand wrap, or we'll do a circuit or something like that, then we'll go back to games for five minutes. Mm. And you just see, you just see the, the smile on their face and the laughter and their shoulders relax. And it's just, yeah, you can literally see it in front of you after these games. And what, do you think that people get the same response when they do boxing as well? I found that when mm. when I had the five days a week, I'd have Monday weights and everyone's like, oh, God, weights or resistance or kettlebell. It was mainly kettlebells. Yeah. Tuesday came. I always put boxing on a Tuesday just on purpose. Yeah. I loved it. It just seemed to be like break up the week and then I'll do, might do boxing again on a Friday. And I found that people would always just gravitate to the boxing classes people more than it. People love it because it's does it, it's like exercise movement without, um, I don't know, it's like sort of a game, but not really. You're just yeah. like punching the stress so out. You're neurally as well as physically, right? So you're and you're learning something maybe, I don't yeah, know. Like, like Even the coordination, everything controlled with boxing is so good. And yeah. everyone loves to, like, no one likes to punch anyone, but everyone likes to punch something. Yeah. So yeah. it's just that whole body sort of thing. Like, yeah, yeah. You're, you're moving and you punch through your feet and you rotate through your hips and yeah, it's just, yeah, for a stress relief, that's probably one of my go-tos, that in the yeah. games. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's like, so I'm hijacking your guest here, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> She's like trying to get a question in here. Yeah. I forgot it's my fine. question. It's fine. I know after you can bring coffee. Do you think it's because it, people uh, are working their body how it's designed for in conjunction with different muscle groups uh, working in conjunction together? Like, you know, when you go into a gym and people say it's back day today, yeah, it's like, shit, I've got to go to the gym four more times this week. Train two-dimensionally. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I've got to go train um, four more times this week yeah. just to get the full effect of my body. Yeah. Where you go to a boxing class and you're working your arms, you're working your core in transition, you know, you're working different muscle groups simultaneously and you're having a little bit of fun. Yeah, definitely. Do you reckon it's because of the using also, their body, the full body, or taking away? Like we've got to remember that movement is a part of life, right? Now we're sitting down for 13, 16 hours a, a day, and people think of movement of oh, I've got to either smash myself for that forty-five minutes and then sit down for sixteen hours. I've got to do exercise to either look good, lose weight, put that much pressure on on myself. Um, so, or I've got to do it because the doctor tells me I've got to do it. Whereas this kind of comes back to, you know, like you're saying, what we're meant to do, mm. but also without having to think, oh, God, I'm, what am I look like in the next selfie or, you know, all yeah, of those. Yeah, daily stresses of Instagram and Facebook are just mental at the moment. Yeah. And then, you, yeah, you, you've got everything, like, just natural stresses in life. It seems like everyone is more stressed these days. I don't know if it's because we've gotten a little, I've gotten a little bit older and I didn't notice it so much before. Mm. But I think just natural day stresses have increased and... 
I was listening to something the other day and it was sort of, it bring it back, like, because this project you is so community focused, I was listening to something on that and I was like, everyone's so stressed about their phone battery dying. When was the last time like you were driving somewhere? And I'd done it before and I had the GPS going to come here. And then if my phone died, <laughs> what do I do? Like, whereas before, no one had phones. So they'd pull over the side of the road, hey, mate, do you know how to get to Edgecliff? No one does that anymore. Yeah. Like it's completely lost in society. Like mm. no one, no one's pulling over the side of the road. I remember being at home, like every month, sort of someone would be at the side of the road, like, oh, how do I get here? Like, how do I get to the entrance? Or how do I get to Togo? Yeah, go this way, this way, this way. Everyone's just addicted to their phone now. Mm. We all like the phone releases that dopamine effect and minimal just, minimal forms of it. It's like yeah. every time you get a notification. It's releasing that dopamine, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then you think of, there's a little test you can do to, to sort of see how bad you are with it. The next time your phone flashes, try and not, see how long it takes you to respond to that. Like Oh, 0. 0.25 seconds. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, I'll be, playing, I'll be doing something and my phone will flash. And even if I can't get to it, I'll be thinking, oh, what is it? Yeah. Is it? But, like, I'm, yeah. but when I'm having a conversation with someone, I see it flashing, they look down the phone, I'm like, just fucking answer your phone. Yeah. You know, like, it just get it, just get it done yeah. with and then put it down, you know? Yeah. Like, even that responsive time, I get a bit like someone sends me an email and I'm busy and then I'm like, oh, far out, I didn't respond to that email, I've got to do it now. Or, you know, Facebook messages didn't respond, yeah. I forgot to do it. Or text messages. It, it, you get into that anxiety about the speed of how you respond as well. Yeah. So mm. not even knowing what they're asking, but if I don't right. respond straight away. Yeah. I got trapped into a horrible loop too. I got the iWatch. Oh, I had yeah. The Apple Watch. Um, not the iWatch, the Apple Watch. So, because I was doing so much outdoor stuff when I was at Tugger, um, I was 50 meters, 100 meters from my phone, and boom, your wrist would go. Yeah. And then your clients know that the phone's on your wrist, and they're like, why hasn't he picked up or messaged me back? Yeah, really? And then you sort of get into this little twine. So, little I was time. like, no way, I'm getting a garment and I'm. Get, get me I'm out about of this to buy a new one. Yeah. So nice. That's a good point. I wanted that new app watch because I'm like, no. yeah, text message. I can get them all the time. My, that's my parents bought me one for my 30th birthday and they, they asked me now, are you still using it? I'm like, yeah, I tell them like I lie to them because yeah. when, when I was PTM at Market Street, I'd have to take a few classes. I'd get text messages on the phone while I'm taking a class and yeah. I'm using it for a stopwatch. Yeah. I'm like, no, nah, stop this. The worst is training. I find when I'm training myself, yeah. that's such a huge distraction is like having a phone for music because I used to have an iPod, yeah. right? So that was it. Phone was in the locker. I'm training. Mm. Now everything's on your phone, music, Spotify. So as you're training, yeah. something comes up, I'm responding. So half my time of training is actually gone to. Yeah, so a half an hour session is now 60 minutes. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's that right. same thing, that buzz. Like if you weren't after that sort of dopamine effect, you would just forget about it and you just continue training at the end of the session you get your phone and, and mm. go for it but yeah. well, we know with the dopamine effects now like it's the thing that is the addiction like it's the alcoholic going to the bar it's the cigarette smoker going out for a smoke like they're after them and it's such a yeah. buzz flash <laughs> and all, now. Like, also with the because you're talking about stress as well um and phones do you reckon keeping up with the joneses have just gone up like tenfold, twenty four, hundred thousand fold because you you keeping up with the Joneses of your of what you see on your social media, your social media, your social media. Where it used to be just the next door neighbor's got the new car. Yeah. Shit, I've got to keep, keep up with him. Yeah. But now you've got to see Katie's new car and your new house and this person's new this. You're like far out. No wonder we're all stressed out. We're trying to chase that extra dollar because yeah. we're just chasing what. The, you know, it's the same sort of scenario. It's like yeah. keeping up with the Jones has gone to a whole new level. And meanwhile, that person that's got the Lamborghini next door sitting in his house depressed because he's so much in debt. Yeah. But he's got a, a mad photo on Instagram. Yeah, he's getting that's a mad right. photo on Instagram, yeah, yeah, exactly like, right. Yeah, you don't, that, uh, I guess that where it comes back to like ego sort of thing too. Like, I'm the hardest person to, like, yeah, I I try and keep the ego out of things and like, I couldn't care less what people are doing yeah. or what they're saying. Mm. I could get called an idiot 100 times a day and it would fly off my back like mm. anything. It frustrates my girlfriend, but <laughs> it's got to do it, I guess. Because, I think yeah, that like, comes from a good, like, now being a mum, I'm trying to think, what builds strength of character? Like, how do I build a daughter that's not affected by what other people are doing and is going to build that strength where if, you know, her friend gets a new Lamborghini that it's not going to somewhat pull her into a, a, a bucket of depression or anxiety? Yeah. Is it coming back to having a good, strong base? or Adversity. Adversity. Well, remember how I was telling you when when did this commando camp? I was part of the oh, strength yeah, and conditioning yeah, staff with the Rabbitohs twenties, oh, yeah, yeah. and they took us on this uh, three day commando hell camp. Yeah, we don't want to 
Honestly, I Adija, hell. It was run by Michael Maguire, or Mike Maguire yeah. had that, and that's where I think he got it from, because he was under Bellamy, wasn't well, he? Well, he was at the storm. Yeah, yeah so he might have got that idea. And he took us on this uh, commando camp. We had to hold a push-up, uh, a plank for an hour. No, a push-up position, because we had to like do all these certain drills. And it uh, might have been an hour and a half, yeah. uh, holding a push-up position, calling you weak dog, you weak C-U-N-T, all this stuff, right? Yeah. And went on for three days. Katie's heard this many, many a times. Yeah. Three but it's still one hour of, I mean, an, hour, sorry, an, an hour, hour, ten, hour and a half. Okay, so the drill was, I, could, I can't explain it. You've got a whole team lined up next to each other, like from, say, the footy post, and then you've got all the team lined up in a line up until the 20-meter line to the footy post. Yep. The last person, we're all in a push-up position, shoulder by shoulder. Last person from the uh, footy post has to crawl underneath and then to the so they go to the front and that's the first person and then the next person crawls underneath there's probably 20 30 guys until all the team is gradually moving down to the other end of the field but they wanted us to move towards the corner post gradually so that took us like 40 minutes to an hour there and then because that's where the the uh, commando car was like you've got to gravitate to the commando car so we're like going out in a sort of wrecked circle can't really explain myself when we get over to the um, lights, the commandos go, no, nah, not good enough. I want you guys to go to the football post now. But we're trying to go one at a time through this bloody tunnel. So we end up doing it for an hour and a half. And that's the worst thing about the commando things, is it? Like you get a normal S&C coach and you're running 60 second laps and you've got to make it by 60 and you get 62 on the eighth one. Mm. Like 59. 59, awesome. yeah, exactly yeah, right. There's no go. Like, nah. you're, you're doing it until you all get under 60. Yeah, and I was, I was the staff member, so I just decided, to, I saw, <laughs> I, I decided to jump in. Well, you saw, I saw Michael Maguire jumping in, doing the box. I'm like, oh, come on, Madge, I'm jumping in with you. You jump out, mate. You're the coach. He's like, no, 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 we'll, we'll do it together. And I saw that. It was like leadership. You know, he was getting, yeah. like, getting caught a weak dog and all this stuff as well. He was like, eat it up, boys. Let's do this. One of them, yeah. But what we found is that this guy kept coming in at really random times, um, and I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Just say, like, two to ten words. Like, I, I learned one fact, and I'm going on a bit of a tangent, but I'll bring it back to your daughter in a second. <laughs> I learned one fact um, when about teammateship and how we talk to each other and motivate each other in a group. When we're all going, fuck these commandos, boys, stuff them, we got this, we got this. Everyone's like, yeah, 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 we got this. And this guy comes in that keeps coming in the whole the whole time, sits us down, middle of like us getting smashed with push-ups or whatever, and he goes, you're full of shit, you're full of white noise. Stop stop talking about, yeah, boys, we've got to do this, yeah, boys, we've got to do that. Stop your talking and find a direction where you got to go and find that in a cohesive environment. Because you're using excess energy yeah. you don't need. I'm like, well, why? Am I? I've been the, I've been that talker on the footy field that whole time. Yeah. I'm like, I shut my mouth then. Yeah. Because I was even doing it as a staff member. Yeah. yeah. I, I, remember told, I remember getting told when I was playing football. You say you make four tackles in a row, you gassed out. You can't do anything anymore, and then they kick it down, and you've made another three or so. And I always got told like, if you're completely gassed and you don't chase from Marga, what's up, sort of thing. And mm. I'm like. You'd be like, and you had no excuse either because they'd be like, why didn't you chase? Oh, mm. I'm just so gassed. Okay, so now put it into perspective of if that guy that you just tackled punched you, would you punch him back? Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, you got energy to fight. you got energy to go and tackle that guy. Like, and a good point. It just made a point in my head. I was yeah. just like, you know what? That's correct. Like, yeah. You've always got a little bit more. Always got but, more. Yeah, there's so much. Yeah. Football and commandos. Just, just yeah. get along really well. But then at the end of this, this guy came up to us and sat us down and he said, and was exactly what we're bringing into contact with your daughter, saying the only way to measure true character and to build character is to put people through adversity yeah. and stress, you know, and to put push past that comfort zone, obviously, yeah. but it's mainly about you have to be put in adversity. You can't avoid it stress. No. You have to be put in that moment so then you can try and overcome it to build character. Yeah. And so that's a clinical psychologist staying that. Yeah. And there's that there's a show on YouTube actually called Surviving the Cut and it's about the US it's based it's a US show and it's about people that are in the army or the navy or anything like that going that one step high to become Navy SEALs or like recons in the army and stuff and it's all about their training, like their 12 week journey or their 30 day journey to get to the next level. Mm. And I remember watching that and just thinking like, I think the Na I watched the Navy SEAL one and their first test was you had to jump into the water and swim 50 meters underwater. Oh, wow. the pool. If you don't make it, 
you get out of the pool, you go to the back of the line. If you don't make, you've got three attempts. And this was in like for the first five minutes of an eight week course. If you don't make the third one, I'm done. I'm ready. Yeah. Well, if you don't make the third one, it wasn't. Oh, have a fourth go. Oh, you got close going. Like, it was. You go home, pack your stuff, you go home. Yeah. And then they were treading water with their guns above the air for like ten minutes, twenty minutes, and then oh, yeah. they had a they had their kit all laid out individually, and they had basically probably maybe thirty pieces. They had to get from basically just their clothes on to their kit on their back within ten minutes. And they sat there and they would, they would time it. 10 minutes would go by. And if all of the group, there's about 40 of them, if all of the group didn't make 10 minutes, they'd do 30 minutes of swim exercise. Oh, no. And then it hit, yeah, exactly. And then it hit me. And then it flashed out for a second and then flashed back. And it was like 10 hours later, they were still doing it. Like, oh, yeah. so it, wasn't, it wasn't like a, after you do three attempts, like, oh, yeah, just keep going. Minute, like, just finish it. Yeah. It was, you just keep going. And, and it's not about the exercise then, it's about the Assistance. pushing past and yeah, yeah. building that adversity. And if, if you've done 10 hours of exercise then, like what is half an hour the next day? Exactly or, right. Similar to stress, like you see people, and you put it on a scale, you see people stuck in traffic and they're, they're throwing stuff. Like, and you'll go, oh, what do you say? Stress out of one to 10. And I go, oh, an eight. Okay, now picture your wife just called you to be in a car crash. What's your stress level then? Oh, an eight. So you're sitting in traffic and you've got the same <laughs> level as when you've just been caught. So then they're like, oh, it's probably a five. And you'll see them like sit back and they'll turn their music up and mm. just enjoy the ride sort of thing. Mm. Like it's, it's, everything's a matter of perspective, I think. Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. I think that's what it comes down to, isn't it, is, is uh, your relative position. We had Mel in here last week from sitting low, reaching high. Yeah. She's been in a wheelchair since she was 14. And, you know, she's done CrossFit competitions and um, she climbed in Greece, in Athens. She climbed whenever the... Um, the, no, Acropolis. The Acropolis. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Is it? Yeah. Uh, it's it's like a I don't know what it is. Like an ancient ruins. In, yeah, I um, stayed in a hotel right, like about hundred meters away from it, and we could see it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So she, she climbed, climbed that, and there's no yeah. like you can't you can't. Do, it's all stones. Yeah. And it's like it's through a wheelchair. Gravel. Yeah. And we were saying last week. Do you think? I mean, this is something that's been taken out of society at the moment. I think is that we thrive on challenge. That's how, I mean, it's like a muscle, right? When you overload it, that's where, how we get results. But now we were talking, uh, you know, with Dave before about participation medals with the kids. You know, everybody gets a fucking participation medal. How does it make you strive to be better or want better? It's kind of, you know, there's no participation event. You either win or, you know, yeah. Great. You win or you learn. You get a pat on the back and your dad says, good job. Yeah. Um, that, My that dad still good. doesn't do that to me. Oh. 31 years old. We are the same person. Yeah, that, that was a shit thing you just did there, man. <laughs> you, oh, you could score six tries and make every tackle and I'd be like, that pick something up. Pick that? something <laughs> up still to this day. You, you dropped that ball in the seventh minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw that one. But then again, that's a, I, I find now that's a good thing. Like, Yeah, 100%. It, it's, it's an ego thing like that. It's You could have been, everyone can pat you on the back and say, yeah, you're a champion. Like, mm. Best guy ever, like for that week. But then, what happens next week when you have a horrible game and your dad's still going? You went alright, mate. Like mm. it's a counterbalance. Sort of yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You won't. You, that that positivity only takes you so far. You, you need to hear that shit. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Just would have been nice to hear a bit more positivity. <laughs> it's for balance, right? <laughs> balance. Well, it's no balance. balance. <laughs> it was all. The balance we, means there's good and yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. John right. Zolo. Johnny Zolo. <laughs> Um, well, look, um, it's 20 past. Wow, we've just been talking, mate. Yeah. That's what happens. You shouldn't have got that third coffee into me. I know. <laughs> so let's finish it off. Well, how we find you? Where? Yeah. Send us your website, promote you. Yeah, so I'm on Instagram. It's probably the easiest funnel to get to. Um, just motion to movement. I think I've been tagged on a few of your things and I've yeah. got some things up. But that's probably the easiest way. I'm just working on the website at the moment with all of the things that I've got going on. Because you're going online, aren't you? Yeah, as I'm well, going online, online programs. Um, so yeah, I'm going online in the new year. I've just linked in with some software, and like I've, I spent about three years looking at getting online, but I didn't know like my. I find my niche is the personal side of things, the one on one, the, the yeah. interaction with clients, and I didn't know how to transfer that into a, an online system. Yeah. Um, and then what I write on a program can be completely different to what. You, you're right, Liam, or mm. you're right, Katie. So I have linked, like I found actually a software that I, that does the majority of them things and I've sort of interlinked the personal side of thing into it. So yeah, that will kick off in the new year. Oh, good yeah. stuff, man. Well, good to hear. Great to hear, actually. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming all the way down. Thank you. Uh, and welcome anytime. And I'm sure you guys are going to catch up with some uh, 
post rugby match. Oh man, hundred percent. Get rid of the junior boys. Yeah, get rid of the junior boys. That's it. I won't say that to uh, my partner's brother though. He's probably watching in. Yeah. Out of the family. I'll get eggs when I'm driving my skin. Yeah. <laughs> Joey's or anything like that. That's it. Oh, thank you yeah. so much, buddy. It's been yeah. an absolute yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Until next time.